<clears throat> Two readings tonight that both tie in uh, in many ways together. In the book of Exodus chapter 25 where we read, that's where we pick up on the story of God giving Moses the pattern or the blueprint, if you want to call it, the pattern for the Ark of the Covenant. The box that was, you'll be familiar with this, but let me just remind you of it anyhow. It was a box that was overlaid with gold. It was a box that was carried uh, by the priests on two staves that were pushed through rings up each side of the box. And the, the, the ark would have been carried on those staves, sometimes on the priest's shoulders. The lid or the top was what we read about this evening. It had the mercy seat. And on either side of the mercy seat, there were these two gold cherubims with wings outstretched, facing the one towards the other and their eyes gazing down upon the mercy seat which sat between them. I want you just to reflect for a moment or two about the Ark of the Covenant. You will find it in the history of the Ark of the Covenant. God says to Moses there that he was to put in there the testimony that he would give him. In other words, that was the tablets containing the Ten Commandments. They were to be placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Later on, you will find that also in the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod. You may remember that story. Whenever his priesthood was challenged, and those who challenged his priesthood, it was decided, look, let's take our rods. Let's take our staff. Let's leave them overnight. And the one that buds, that's the one that God has chosen. And of course, the next day, Aaron's staff had budded. In other words, God had confirmed his priesthood. You will also find that in the Ark of the Covenant, there was a pot of manna that was kept. You'll know that story. As the children of Israel journeyed through the promised, or journeyed towards the promised land through the wilderness, and God miraculously fed, you know, I think that's an incredible miracle. He fed over three million people for 40 years, and he never had to sow a seed. Isn't that tremendous? And every day they went out, and there was sufficient supply for over three million people every day. They were told that they would gather too much. It went bad. The Bible tells us there were worms in it. And yet in the ark, in the ark of the covenant, there was a pot of manna which was kept good. And so we have these three things that were included in the ark. Let me just symbolize them for you for a moment or two. I believe that the, the Ten Commandments that were there is the law of God, of course. But it speaks to us of the law that was broken because they couldn't keep the commandments. In fact, whenever Moses came down from the mountain the first time around, they had made a golden calf and they had already broken the laws that Moses held within his hand. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so the law was broken and it was in the Ark of the Covenant. You'll find it throughout the history of Israel. The priesthood that Aaron represented pointed forward at all times and spoke to the one who would come, the mediator that God would send between God and man. The priest represented the people before God. And the priesthood looked forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come to represent man before God for all of eternity. And of course, the, the rod spoke of that priesthood. The pot of manna, the food that God gave them that they gathered in the wilderness, spoke again of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in John's gospel and in chapter 6, Jesus said that God gave them manna from heaven to eat. But he says, I am the living bread. And so all of these things that were in the ark all had their own significance. There was a law that was broken. There was one who would represent them, the mediator that would come, the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus there was a pot of manna, which was the living bread that God sent down, the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. And above all of that was this that's called the mercy seat. Angels overspread the mercy seat, as I've said, their wings touched above the mercy seat, and their faces looked towards one another, but gazed down upon the mercy seat. And God says in this portion of Scripture, I will meet you above the mercy seat. I will commune with you 
from above the mercy seat. You see, friends, there had to be a mercy seat because in the box was the law that was broken. In the box was the law that man just could not uphold. And so because that law had been broken, the mercy seat was there. And if you know the story of Israel, you'll know that every year the lamb was slain and the blood of the lamb was taken in and it was sprinkled upon the mercy seat. And the blood of the sacrificial lamb each year covered the sins of the people. That's the history of what we're looking at here in these verses before us. In Psalm 36, whenever you move over to there, David begins in that psalm. He didn't take the time to read it. Let me just read you a couple of verses at the beginning of that psalm. Because David begins by laying bare the secret thoughts and the intents of the natural man. Listen to what he says in verse 1, Psalm 36. It says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. There's the intents, there's the thoughts, there's the transgression of the wicked, the unseen man. He has broken God's law. And yet verse 1 here says, he says, there is no fear of God before his eyes. And in verse 2 he goes on and he says, for he flatters himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. You know, friends, whenever, whenever we deny God, it is usually because you like to flatter yourself. When there's no God, there's no holiness. When there is God, there is holiness. And you see, man is everything but holy. When there's God, there's a higher power. And man likes to think that he has all of the power. When there's God, there's someone greater who's in control. And man likes to think that he is in control. When there's God, there's righteousness and purity. And man hates to be called unrighteous and to be called impure. And you see, that's why man denies God. That's why a person denies God. Because with God out of the picture, man can flatter himself. Let me read the verse to you again. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. With God out of the picture, man can look at himself, man can flatter himself. You see, there's no higher holiness. There's no higher power. There's no higher control. There's no higher measure of righteousness. In other words, by denying God, man appears to be okay. He flatters himself. Man can clap himself on the back. Man can set his own standards. Man can set his own course. Man can feel that he's in complete control of it all. And you see, that makes man look good. And that's what the psalm is saying here. But friends, there is God. Creation declares his existence. Creation declares his handiwork. You know, they tell us that you take, you take the, a butterfly and you take the wing of a butterfly and the veins run through the wing and carry the blood or carry the fluid. And yet they tell us that that came about by chance. The earth spins at a certain speed. And once every 24 hours, you have one complete cycle, which gives us day. The earth travels around the sun 365 and a quarter days every year it takes it to get there. And in doing that, as the earth turns, you have day, you have night, and you have the different seasons as it travels around the sun. And yet they tell us that's all by chance. Friends, creation declares the existence of God. The word of God declares the existence of God. There is a God. And the Bible says he's the one with whom we all have to do. And you know, even in spite of all of that, our own hearts declare that there is God. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, in John's Gospel chapter 1, the writer says, This was that light that lighteth every man 
that cometh into the world. Every single one of us has something deep down inside our own hearts that cries out for God, that cries out for that higher being, that cries out for, for communion, that cries out for fellowship with a creator. And that's placed inside every single one of us. That's why, and I've said this before, that's why whenever you go to the most remote place upon this planet, you will still find people who worship something because that's what's based, what's been placed inside the heart of man. And so there is God. And this evening, I'm asking you quite simply this. Are you, could you be here tonight and perhaps you're denying God? You deny his existence. Or tell me tonight, could you be here and you've never met with this God? Because God says to Moses, look, he says, I want to meet with you. I want to commune with you. I'll meet with you. I'll commune with you from above the mercy seat. In spite of the fact that the law has been broken, God has determined a place where he wants to meet and commune with his created. Look again with me, if you will, at Exodus chapter 25. Let me read verse 22 to you one more time. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of of Israel. God wants to meet with us. God wants to commune with us. God says, I will meet you above the mercy seat. You see, I want to tell you this evening of a place of, of safety. And I want to tell you this evening of a place of, of refuge, a place of, praise God, security for your soul. It's a place where you can meet with the Almighty God. It's a place where you can experience God in all of his fullness. And it's a place where you can commune with this wonderful creator, God and Lord. David mentions it, if you want to go back to Psalm 36, verse 7. This is what David says. Under the shadow of thy wings. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. And you see, this is what David says. He says, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. The mercy seat is under the shadow of those wings that were made at that time. And you see, friends, there's no other way of getting under the saving, protecting power of God. You've got to come by faith to the place where God has appointed to the place where God says, I will meet with you there. You come there by faith. The lamb, as we've said, the lamb was slain each year. The blood was carried into the holy of holies by the high priest. And the blood was sprinkled upon the mercy seat and Israel's sin was dealt with. That's what God had said. That's how God said it would be. And that was the covenant that God had entered into with Israel, and their sin was covered by the blood, and they received mercy. Praise God. They received mercy from the Lord God Jehovah. That's Israel. That's their situation. But you know, today you could be sitting here tonight and you could be saying, Well, that's Old Testament, that's all so long ago. Friends, today we can bring this forward quite easily, and it's so relevant to every one of us this evening. You see, we have broken his laws, haven't we? We have broken the law. But praise God tonight, we can look by faith away to Calvary and we can say the lamb has been slain. We can look by faith tonight to Calvary and we can say, praise God, God's own blood has been shed. God's own blood. And sin tonight, praise God, can be forgiven and cleansed and not just covered. But praise God, washed away by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read you a verse from Colossians chapter 2. Verse 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Do you know there's a record in heaven about every single one of us? A record that's kept handwriting of ordinances that's against us, that highlights the word of God, 
that highlights how we have failed to live up to the word of God, that highlights the commands of God, that highlights how we have failed to keep those commands. And thank God tonight, Paul writing there to the church at Colossae could say, through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that he took our sin and shed his blood upon the cross of Calvary, that handwriting of ordinances that was against us has been blotted out. It was contrary to us, but praise God it has been taken out of the way because it has been nailed to his cross. Oh, friends, what a glory tonight. And God says, I will meet with you at the cross. I want to ask you very simply this evening, have you come by faith believing? Have you come accepting what God has done for you through Christ Jesus at the cross of Calvary? Can I ask you tonight, have you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you accepted his death as your lamb, as your sacrifice? Because praise God through the blood, the blood of the everlasting covenant, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, you can meet with God under the shadow of his wings. The cross of Calvary is the mercy seat. It says here, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Dear one, I want to say this to you tonight. Allers have done that. And they have found in him everything that they need for time and for eternity. Can I also say this to you tonight? Others are doing it. All over the nation tonight where services like this are being held, people will respond to the Lord Jesus Christ, coming, putting their trust in him, casting their all, seeking his mercy, and trusting in the precious blood that he has shed. And tonight I want to ask you, dear one, what about you? What about you? Are you denying God? Have you met with God? Will you come and meet with God? Let me just give you one or two reasons very quickly as to why you should. First of all, if you go back to Psalm 36, verse 5, look at it. He says in that verse, he says, Thy mercy is in the heavens. Why should you come to the mercy seat tonight? Why should you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because his mercy is in the heavens. Praise God tonight. Being in the heavens, it's high enough to overtop all the altitudes of human guilt. No matter how great that guilt might be, praise God, his mercy is higher still. Hallelujah. Thy mercy is in the heavens. Listen to what Psalm 103 verse 11 says. As far as the heavens is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. There's no amount of guilt that could be piled upon any person, but praise God, his mercy is higher still. Hallelujah. And you can come to Christ tonight. You can put your faith in Christ tonight because his mercy is greater than them all. No matter how great No matter how great the guilt, praise God, his mercy is higher still. Let me give you another one. Again, we're still in verse 5. It says there, thy faithfulness reaches unto the skies. Oh, friends, the clouds may come and the clouds may go, but the sky in all its purity, it remains eternally the same. You see, we look at days it rains and the gray clouds stream across our sky. Have you looked at the sky over this last few days, have you? Where there's no clouds there and there's that beautiful blue. It's always there. It always remains there. In spite of the fact that times we can't see it because of the lower cloud cover, the clouds that come our way. Whenever those clouds are gone, praise God, the blueness of the atmosphere, the sky is always there. Thy faithfulness reaches onto the skies. It remains, and praise God, it's eternally the same. The faithfulness of God is the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9 says, He is faithful that hath promised. And that faithfulness will not fail till the objects of that faithfulness reaches the skies. Let me give you another reason. Look this time at verse 6 of the psalm. 
Verse 6, let me read it to you. It says this, Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord. Thou preservest man and beast. The revised version says, Thy righteousness is like the mountains of God. The righteousness of God. Friends, who can rise to that? He's pure. He's holy. He's completely righteous. It's like the mountaintop that pierces the clouds where no human foot has ever trod. Who can search? Who can find out God? Who can aspire to rise to be like God? Yet he has made Christ, the Bible says, to be righteousness for us. He has made Christ to be our righteousness, even the righteousness of God, which is unto all and upon all of them that believe. Christ was on all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He aspires, he rises, he is the righteousness of God for you and for me. And so we see these reasons as to why tonight you can put your trust You can put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can meet with him. You can put your trust under the shadow of his wings. Because we see his mercy is in the heavens. We see his faithfulness reaches the skies. And we see his righteousness is like the mountains of God. But look very quickly at verse 6 again. Because it says also in that verse, Thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord. Thou preservest man and beast. Friends, if his righteousness is high, his judgment reach low, even to the lowest hell. There is no escaping the justice of Almighty God. There is no slipping away from the justice of Almighty God. The law has been broken, and someday God will judge. And as we say often from this pulpit, thank God tonight the Savior was judged on your behalf and on my behalf. And you either accept the judgment as he has paid it at the cross of Calvary or you pass into eternity without him and you face the judgment on your own before the one, the God, the one with whom, as we've already said, the one with whom we have to do. His judgments are as deep as hell. None shall escape the judgment of Almighty God. His judgments are sure. Sin will not go unnoticed. All sin will be judged. But look at verse 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Oh yes, his judgments are deep. Sin will be judged. Every sin that has ever been committed will be judged. But you see, his loving kindness, praise God, is precious. God in the person of his Son And his loving kindness has spread the wings of his grace over a perishing world. God has spread the wings of his grace over your life and over my life in an effort to draw you on to himself, to that mercy seat where you can find forgiveness. He sent his son, Jesus came. You know the story at Christmas, for unto us or unto you is born this day in the city of David a saviour who is Christ the Lord. He came to die so that you and I might live. He came to give his life so that you and I might receive life. He came to live the righteous life so that you and I might be attributed his righteousness in life. And he rose from the dead, praise God, bringing forth victorious, endless life in the power of the everlasting covenant. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Thy loving kindness is precious. Thank God tonight for his loving kindness. How precious is the loving kindness of Almighty God. The Bible says God so loved the world. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten Son His loving kindness is precious that whosoever would believe in him should not perish. Oh, broken the law, yes, but should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because Christ, Christ shed his blood 
to provide mercy. The hymn writer says, wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions and now I am free. Why? All because Jesus was wounded for me. How precious is the loving kindness of God. He was wounded for you and he was wounded for me. I want to ask you again tonight, have you made him yours? Is he your Lord? Is he your personal saviour? Because these are all reasons why you should be beneath the wings of God's mercy and the wings of God's love. Friends, he stalks us every day of our lives, seeking to grab our attention that we might meet with him there at the mercy seat through Christ our Savior. We see also blessings enjoyed. Let me just close with this. Under his wings is a place of abundant Satisfaction. Look at verse 8 of the psalm. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Place of abundant satisfaction. The Hebrew word there is water. The river of his grace is amply sufficient. Praise God for those who hide in him. That verse goes on and that, that verse says, And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. Jesus cried, if any man thirst, let him come. Let him come on to me. Oh, thank God tonight. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain that's filled with his great love. Come to the waters. There is a vast supply. For there is a river. Oh, thank God, it never shall run dry. Jesus says, if you're thirsty, he says, come to me. To come to him is to come to the fountain of all life. The Bible says in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right hand pleasures forevermore. And then finally, under his wings is the place of abundant satisfaction. It's also a place of clearness of vision. Look at verse 9. For with thee is the fountain of life in thy light shall we see light. In the light of his presence, we can clearly see the light of his truth. To trust in him is to pass from darkness into his marvelous light. In his light, we see light. In the light of Jesus, we see light which shines upon sin. In the light of Jesus, we see light that shines upon self we see what sin brought to our Lord Jesus Christ in that light it cost him everything as he shines his light upon us we see our own sin we see how unworthy we are in ourselves in his light the light shines on life we begin to see what life is really all about it's not about accumulating this and accumulating that and doing this and doing that friends life is about getting to know God our creator, the lover of our souls, our redeemer. In the light of his light, we see light shining upon death. Some of us or every one of us someday will have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death. The light of God shines upon that. Where will you be in that day? The light shines in all of these things, on sin, on self, on life, on death. The light shines on immortality. The light shines on eternal life. Where will you spend eternity? Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he said, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And so we see the mercy seat. We see God's provision. And then we see David in this psalm as he takes up his mind inspired by the Holy Spirit. His mind runs to that mercy seat, to the ark that he knew. And the day we stand, praise God, upon the other side of Calvary. And we see in these things the foreshadow which points completely to the sufficiency of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
bring into your life and to mine everything that's good from God, everything that's blessed, and everything that God wants you to enjoy in life, and then to experience out to be with him for all of eternity. And so I'm asking you tonight, what about you? Are you denying God? Have you put your faith, have you put your trust in God through our Lord Jesus Christ? Have you come by faith to the mercy seat? The only place where God has promised to meet. Friend, I want you tonight to look away towards Mount Calvary. To that old rugged cross where the Son of God laid down his life. So that you, through him, might receive that mercy that God wants you to receive in spite of the fact that like all the rest of us, you have broken his law and yet the blood cleanses and the blood brings mercy and abundance of life. Is Christ yours tonight? Will you take him tonight as your Lord, as your Savior? Let's just bow in a moment's prayer. We're sitting for a moment just in the stillness of this meeting. And I just want to ask you tonight, has God perhaps been tugging at your heart strength? You don't know him. You've never called upon him for mercy. You've never met with him. And tonight he's speaking to you. You sense his voice. And I want to encourage you tonight, if that is your experience, can I ask you tonight, don't turn a deaf ear to him. In love and in mercy, he comes to you again to point you to himself. Will you come tonight? Or will you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you meet with God tonight through him? who upheld the law and shed his blood for you so that you could be saved. Will you meet with him now? Just in the stillness of your heart, reach out to him. Forgive me, Lord. I have sinned. You died for me, Lord. Thank you. Lord, I ask you to forgive me, to save me, to cleanse me in that blood, to be my saviour. I want to tell you tonight, if you just call upon him and you're earnest from the depth of your heart, praise God, he will meet with you in that place of mercy provided by our Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you reach out to him right now? Take him at his word and trust him. And then we're going to pray in just a moment. But why don't you touch him now in prayer? Lord, the hymn writer says there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. You only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And we give you thanks and we give you praise tonight for your son. Oh Lord, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for the fact that you loved us so much that he came, that you gave him to take our place that we might live through the finished work of Calvary. And now, Lord, at this time, we just pray for every head that's bowed in this meeting before you this evening. And again, we say tonight, Lord, you know each one of us. Bless your own people, Lord. Encourage and strengthen. Edify your people. Build them up, Lord, in their most holy faith. But, Lord, save. Should there be any here tonight who don't know you, will you save Will you move upon their lives by your Spirit and draw them to this great mercy through our Lord Jesus Christ. To that end, Lord, bless your word, we pray. To every single heart, we just commit it to you now in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.